Oh boy, did Jesus wash the feet of his disciples? That's what we're going to talk about today in John 13. Now it is right before the Passover feast. And Jesus said, it says, he knew the hour had come to depart this world. Again, not the hour, hour, just the time. The time is here. All these times that Jesus kept saying, you know, like at the wedding of Cana, my time has not yet come. Well, you know what? Now the time has come and it's time for, for him to go back and go back to heaven. He's having the supper. It's interesting. John doesn't really go into much details. Someone in the commentaries kind of mentioned that. I'm sorry, sometimes I can't name. I read like eight commentaries and see a couple of videos about every chapter of the Bible. And so I'm sorry, I can't remember really who said what at any given time. But saying the fact that the reason John probably has different details and why it's not the synoptic gospels like the other gospels are, is he had a chance to read those other gospels. We are talking about 90 AD when the other ones maybe wrote their gospels around 50, around 70. He had 40, 20 years to read the other words of the other disciples. But okay, they already went into all of this detail. I don't have to go in and explain it yet again. I can have this other point of view. I can have this other level of detail because the other Gospels capture those other details. I thought that was a very good point. During the supper, the devil had already entered the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son. And we wondered, or I wondered, if Judas did this because he thought Jesus was going to be able to fight off, take command, take control. We don't know what lies the devil put into his heart. We know that when he saw it happen, it brought him grief. This was not God forcing Judas to be the betrayer. There had to be a betrayer, but it didn't have to be Judas. Judas had that heart to let the devil go into him, to hear the words of the devil. We've heard the words of the devil when he talked to Eve. Oh, you know, I didn't really say that, did he? You know, you know the lies that he says. Who knows what he said, but Judas had the devil go into him. There was going to be a betrayer. Jesus knew it. The father put everything in his hands, was going to go back up to God. He rose from supper. He put down his outer garments. So I believe that there's going to be kind of linen garments underneath. There's going to be outer garments, which can be more like a robe, a little bit thicker, and sometimes a sash, a belt, some other things. And then it says he took off those garments took a towel, tied it around his waist, and then he poured water into a basin and washed the feet of his disciples. This is a lowly servant's job. This would be the lowliest person that you can find. That would be their job. And then when Peter saw it, he's like, I am not going to let you wash my feet. (laughs) And he says, you know, you don't understand, but you will understand later. And Peter's like, no, you're never going to wash my feet. I don't wash your feet. You have no part with me. You have no share. You know, you're not in my mission. You're not a part of this. What's interesting is we've seen Peter in so many cases be boastful, say the rash thing, say the bold thing. Peter has been with Jesus so long. He immediately turns around and says, okay, well, if that's the case, then don't just wash my feet. Wash my head and my hands. You know, he signed on real fast. Peter has learned that when Jesus speaks, that's the end of the conversation. And so then he goes into this analogy about bathing and being clean, but not every one of you is clean because he knew he was betrayed. Not all of you are clean. wonder if Judas was just standing there shivering in his own shoes. Or is he like Caiaphas where he's so arrogant? I'm doing this for the better good. Boy, we don't know his state of mind at this point. But then he's done and he washed their feet. He explains to them, do you understand, you know, all of this? You call me teacher, you call me Lord, and you're right. That's who I am. You know, Jesus was sort of shunning terms at the early parts of his ministry because he didn't want the word getting out. But now he's all for it. He is Lord. He is teacher. I have given you an example to wash each other's feet. Someone said that this is something that's specific to other apostles, other disciples of Christ. This isn't us going around and washing everybody's feet. We're washing the feet of the people who serve God. We are servants to each other. 
as servants of Christ. So you should do what I've done and be an example. The servant's not greater than the master, nor the messenger greater than the one who sent him. I'm, I'm on top. I am the chosen one. And we talked last time about blessings and promises that were conditional. You can always tell when they are because there's going to be ifs in front of them. If you know these things, blessed are you who do them, not just who know them. So this is where we get into this point of do our works cause our salvation? And I think we've all settled, at least I've settled, on the fact that we cannot work for our salvation. But when you know things, you're blessed when you do them. And the word bless again means the person who has the greatest happiness and joy of any person on the planet. It's not a salvation thing. You should do the things because it'll make you blessed. And he says, I'm not speaking of all of you because I know whom I've chosen. I know who I picked here and the scripture is going to be fulfilled. And he who ate bread has lifted his heel against me. I'm telling you this now so when it takes place, you may believe I am he. I am. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me, God the Father. Right up to the very end, he is teaching them. So when he's done saying this, Jesus was troubled. I mean, he's fully human, right? He's still God. He's still man. And he is troubled. I think God is troubled. I was trying to think, is God mad at us? Is God disappointed in us? I think God weeps for us. It's just like when Lazarus dies. This was not the way this world was supposed to go. And he's troubled. He knows what's about to happen. He knows what's going to happen to his disciples. Remember at one part in The Chosen, he, they have the actor looking at each of the apostles and had sadness in his face. And it made me think that of this particular passage, that when Jesus is looking at his apostles, and he's troubled in spirit. Is he troubled because he knows their future? He knows what's going to happen to each of them. And he says, one of you will betray me. And so they start looking at each other. Which one of us is going to betray him? One of the disciples whom Jesus loved, probably John, maybe John's referring to himself without calling out his own name, lying at the table, Peter motioned to him, asked Jesus, who are you speaking? So that disciple, John, probably, Leaning back, says, Lord, who is it? Who is going to, you know, do this? Jesus says, it is he who I give this morsel of bread that I dip. Again, this is the Passover meal. And he gave it to Judas. And after he'd taken it, Satan entered him. And Jesus said to him, you know, go do what you're going to do. Do it quickly. So at that point, Judas knows that Jesus knows. Everybody knows. And the table knew what he said. Some thought or misunderstood the situation. They said, oh, well, you know, whatever it is that Judas was supposed to go out and buy. Was he going to buy something for the feast? Was he going to go do something? Go do it now. But that's not what Jesus was talking about at all. This is the night. And at the very end, Judas leaves. Jesus says, now the son of men is glorified and God is glorified in him. Talks about how while he's still here with him, calls them little children, you'll seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, I say to you too, where you're going, I can't come. Remember, they thought he was going to kill himself. But instead, he gives them a new commandment at this point. Love one another, just as I loved you. You are loved. You are also to love one another. Love each other so the people will know that you're my disciples when you have love for one another. We talk about this all the time, is that we hope the world sees us because of how much love we have for each other as Christians. And I know we don't portray that very often. We portray either arrogance at our belief, because you don't believe exactly like I believe, or we don't like how that person voted, or we don't like how that person worships, but this person doesn't. We are so full of bickering for each other. We need to love each other so that the world can see the love of Jesus in us. This word in Greek is agape, and it's that, again, that big love that is beyond just brotherly love. It is sacrificing. It is doing everything for each other. That's how we know we all are disciples of God, by how we have loved each other. Then Simon Peter says, well, where are you going? <laughs> yeah, not getting it. 
Jesus repeats again, where I'm going, you can't follow, but you will follow afterwards. Boy, you know, and again, they are. We're going to see the disciples one by one die. Some of them put to death for their faith. John, he was exiled on the island and then I think taken out of exile and then he died of old age. But most of them died because of their faith in Jesus. You're going to follow me. You're all going to die and follow me to heaven. Peter's like, why can't I follow you now? I'm going to lay down my life for you. Again, that bold statement Peter always gives. And he says, will you? The rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Again, that. I mean, it just must have been, oh gosh, you know, such a heart-wrenching thing, you know, for Peter to hear that. But when he does it, we know he cries. He weeps bitterly at this. But we know that's going to happen next. All right, that ends chapter 14. I think that chapter 13 through 17 all happens in the upper room after the Passover meal. Everything is going to happen right here in this room. I joked about how long of a day the Sermon on the Mount day was. I mean, first you had the Sermon on the Mount and you had the Lord's Prayer and you had all these teachings and you had all these messages and it must have been exhausting. This day must have been something else because Jesus is going to give one last batch of teachings, some of which they've never heard before, right before Jesus goes to his death. What I'm going to meditate on is that concept of loving each other as disciples of Christ, but also washing each other's feet. That was an honoring thing. It was a servant's thing. To be great, you have to be a servant. What things are like that in our society today? that are so honoring of another person, that we can take each other as disciples and honor them, serve them, help them, pray for them, love them, do all the things that Jesus asked us to do towards each other. I don't think we do a very good job of it now. I know I don't do a very good job of it, but we should. I don't like the idea. I can't imagine someone washing my feet. I am more willing to wash other people's feet than have my feet washed. What does it mean about me and the fact that I can't be served by other people. That is a very hard thing for me to do, and I'm going to meditate a little bit on that. What I'm going to pray about is that I always have Jesus so strongly in me. The devil can't enter me. I don't invite him in. That I always go in the path of the disciples. They stuck by Jesus. Of course, they all scattered when the shepherd was struck, you know, as it said he was going to do. They all, in their own ways, betrayed him initially. It's not like Judas. Let's pray that we never go that path of whatever happened with Judas. We, we never go that path either. And what I'm going to share with other people is the fact that Jesus asked us to serve each other as disciples in Christ, that we should love each other, that we should be there for each other, that the ultimate Lord of this earth acted as the lowliest servant in order to wash the feet of his disciples, his apostles. I think everyone needs to know that in order to be the greatest, you must become the least. And in order to become a leader, you have to be a servant. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate so much you listening to this podcast. Please remember, you can always email me, Jill with smallstepswithgod.com. I'd love to hear from you. There's also my Twitter account, which is in the show notes. If you have something you want to say to me, I would love to hear it or how your walk is going. I hope this Bible study is interesting to you as we read the Bible as a slow roll and go through this in great detail. Thank you very much. 